glad you're here this morning. I've entitled the message, When I Hear from the King. We're going to end up in Acts chapter 8, but I'd like you, if you would, this morning to open your Bibles and to begin in Zechariah chapter 9. From Zechariah chapter 9, we'll go to Luke chapter 19, and then we'll end up in Acts chapter 8. So we'll begin in Zechariah chapter 9. This week, the week that we're celebrating, this week we celebrate the Holy Week of the entrance of Jesus Christ to Jerusalem, followed by the Last Supper, Jesus Christ's disciples, and then the, the betrayal of Jesus Christ, the crucifixion of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the burial and the resurrection, completing with the resurrection, is arguably the single most important event or week in human history. I would submit there is not a more important week from the creation of time and this earth than the week that Jesus Christ that began with this triumphal entry into Jerusalem. That nothing else has happened before and nothing else will happen after uh, that will be of more significance than Jesus Christ fulfilling prophecy and beginning, uh, in effect, in this week, the, the essence of our salvation. You see, it was not enough that Jesus Christ came to earth. That would not have solved the sin issue in our life. And it was also not enough that Jesus Christ died. But the fact that Jesus died as the Son of God and that he was risen again the third day by God himself was enough to author our faith and complete it. The Bible says that Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. And this faith that we see that we're able to experience as a believer in Jesus Christ, truly this begins, in a sense, with this week, the final, if I can, the final act that is done. So I want to turn our attention this morning in a, in a brief way to some prophecy from Zechariah chapter 9. We'll see the fulfillment in Luke chapter 19. And then we've been in the series on Acts, and in Acts chapter number 8, there is just a little truth there that I want to just impart to us today that I think will help us. And I'm titled the message, When I Hear from the King. Now, the background for what is going on here in Jerusalem is that the Jews have been under Roman bondage and Roman rule. The Roman Empire is now almost at its height. It has conquered many nations and many different people groups. It has not conquered in a, in a traditional sense, in the sense that it has now enslaved them, and many nations and empires came along and would conquer other nations and thereby move them and enslave them. But Rome, though it had not moved them, it was no less in power over the children of Israel and the Jews. The Jews bucked against this. They had many taxes they did not appreciate. Their own laws were subject to the laws of Rome, which superseded theirs, and they felt the bondage and they felt captivity, even though it wasn't as realized as other nations had been in. And so when Jesus Christ rode in on a donkey, just like prophecy will show us that he did, he is picturing a conquering king. Now that is a different picture than we have of a conquering king. In current culture, we would think of a, of a ruler coming in, perhaps in M1 Abram tanks or some other uh, montage of that sense. And maybe in that, in the Roman time, they would have come on uh, huge stallions, horses, but, but in the Jewish prophecy and law, the donkey was a, symbol, was a symbol of a ruler here, and a peaceful ruler. And so when Jesus Christ came into the city, these Jews were cheering and rejoicing because they imagined that Jesus Christ was coming to overthrow Rome, and that their time being subject to another culture was done. And their time of listening to another set of rules was done. And Jesus Christ would finish his rule and go in there, they imagined, and just overthrow uh, uh, Herod and, and uh, overthrow Pontius Pilate and overthrow Caesar Augustus in Rome and just, listen, he's going to be the ruler. This is wonderful. But that's not why Jesus Christ came. And he rode in to Jerusalem every bit as king. He is the king of kings. Whether he sat on the throne in Rome at that time or not, he is still the king. But look, please, in Zechariah chapter 9, verse number 9. And the Jews will see in Luke chapter 19, they knew this prophecy. They knew the promise. The Bible says this, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. 
He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a colt of the fall of an ass. When Jesus Christ came, the Jews missed the prophecy. They saw the king part, but they missed the salvation part. He is just, like the prophecy says, and he does bring salvation, just not like they thought he was going to bring it. They thought his salvation would come about with bloodshed and with rebellion. Yet the Bible tells us he comes lowly and in humility. Please, if you would turn to Luke chapter 19, the triumphal entry of Jesus Christ is found in all four of the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But it is Luke chapter 19 that we reference this morning. And in Luke chapter 19, we'll begin just in verse number 35, though we could, if we had time, uh, read the entire process. But in Luke chapter 19, beginning in verse number 35, and they brought him, this is the donkey, the colt, to Jesus. And they cast their garments upon the colt, and they set Jesus thereon. And as he went, they spread their clothes in the way. And when he was come nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Does that last little phrase remind you of any other portion of scripture? Maybe found in Luke chapter number two to a group of shepherds perhaps that were just minding their own business one night. And the angels came and one announced to the shepherds, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. And he talks about then the peace and the glory that will come to everyone. And here the disciples reference, This is it. This is King Jesus. Here he comes. His mighty works will now come to fruition. This is King Jesus and his might will be clearly seen. My friends, I'm here to tell you that the might of King Jesus is still clearly seen. But it is not always seen like we want it or imagine it to be seen. I'd like us to pray this morning and turn to Acts chapter 8. We're going to find this message when I hear from the king. Lord, we have a few moments this morning to look at your word. Lord, I pray that you would make this time profitable. That as we look at your word, that we would clearly understand it, that your spirit would touch us. Lord, I pray that we would hear from you and that there's an area or areas in our life that we've not been listening to you and hearing from you, that you would speak to us clearly today. In Jesus' name I ask. We'll give you the praise and glory. Amen. And this morning, I'm in time of the message when I hear from the king. What happened next was that Jesus rode into Jerusalem, and for a few days, all was good. The, the passage goes down, the Pharisees then wanted Christ to rebuke the disciples and said, listen, tell them to stop shouting at you and proclaiming you as, as king and Hosanna. The Pharisees knew the prophecy, and Jesus said, if they don't cry out, the stones will cry out showing that Jesus Christ will not give away his glory to anything or anybody. But he does set it aside for the cross and for mankind. He goes on that week to face extreme circumstances and heresy and blasphemy. There are those that will drag him before uh, the, the, the chief priests and the rulers there before Pontius Pilate and before Herod. And they will demand that Jesus Christ be killed, be dealt with, because he has rejected Caesar and because he has set himself up as God. The problem is that Jesus Christ did reject Caesar because he's the true ruler and he is God. 
Though they accused him of being, of being blasphemous, he was merely telling the truth. Jesus Christ always tells the truth. He then went and died on the cross and then buried, rose again, and then a few short days later went back to heaven. And now his disciples are left behind. Imagine that you were a disciple and you saw this. And imagine that same disciple who then saw this. And then imagine your disciple who then saw and touched Jesus Christ after the resurrection. What would your faith be like if Jesus Christ were to walk among us this morning? If Jesus Christ were to come down the the aisle right here and make his way toward the platform, is there a single person in here who would not turn in awe toward our Savior, Jesus Christ? Would we not shout praises as he made his way down the aisle just if, if if he were to come and walk down the aisle to the stage? Would you not want, if you could, take off a coat and put it on his path? Would I not, as quickly as I could, get off the stage? Don't say amen too fast. <laughs> amen. But, but would I not, would any of us not step aside for Jesus Christ? If we're in the middle of a song, would we not set the microphone down, hush the music and say, Christ, it is all yours now. Would you not speak to us? Would you not say something? And would we not, with, with attention, rapt attention, listen to every word that he would speak if he were to walk down the aisle and walk up these palm branches and stand on this stage and speak to us? How long would be too long to listen to Jesus Christ this morning? What if we went past noon? Who among us would look at our watches? Who among us would say, wow, Lord, wrap it up? Only the most carnal and fleshly among us would have that thought. Would we not say, listen, let, let the beef burn. Does it matter? Jesus Christ is here this morning. Would we not listen if he said, listen, I'm going to speak for three hours. Would we not say and shout, Lord, take four, take five, whatever you want. Would we not speak that way? What if we went throughout the afternoon and the evening service? Maybe our stomach was, rumble, was, was grumbling and rumbling. Would you not apologize to those around you? And I guarantee if Jesus Christ were speaking, you would not walk out to, go by, to get a bite to eat. You would say, you know what? I can eat tomorrow if I have to. I will stay right here where Christ speaks. You see, I've titled the message, When I Hear From the King. Can you imagine what it would be like to hear from the king? Before you answer, you can imagine it. Because Jesus Christ still wants to speak to each one of us. He still wants to communicate truth to each one of us. And in Acts chapter 8, we're going to find an account. In this account, we're going to find a man by the name of Philip. And he's going to get a message from a messenger from the king. And I want to point out something about this message this morning because Jesus Christ is no less powerful and no less active, and no less real than when he walked down and rode down that path to Jerusalem. He is no less genuine than when the disciples were able to interact with him, and he has no less truth than the early church heard than that you and I can hear today. But my friends, there is an epidemic out there where Christians and non-Christians lack purpose, mission, direction, and fulfillment. And you want to know why? Because we've not heard from the king. When you hear from the king, you find direction. When you hear from the king, you find mission. When you hear from the king, you find purpose. When you hear from the king, you have passion. And if Jesus Christ were to stand up here this morning and he were to give us a mission, would you try to fulfill it? What among us would say, you know, Lord, I'd love to do what you say this morning, but I'm a little bit busy. If Christ were to give us a directive this morning as he, after walking down this aisle and standing in this pulpit and would say, listen, I want you to go and reach out to a neighbor, who among us would say, you know what, Lord, that's a great call and I'll do it sometime next week? Or how many of us would at that moment say, yes, sir, here am I, use me. 
Would we not then shout, Lord, is there anything else you'd have for me to do? Lord, I can take care of that today. What about tomorrow? Lord, I'm here. I'm yours to control. I'll be that living sacrifice. When we hear from the king, we find mission and purpose and direction and passion and fulfillment. Yet there's a recent study that said three out of five adults lack mission and purpose in their life. This is why people stumble about in life looking for love, that relationship, looking for the job, looking for the next big, uh, the big success, looking for fame. They're trying to find what the king delivers. Would you look in Acts chapter 8? We're going to read just one account this morning and just a simple little story beginning in verse number 20, uh, in verse number 26. Where the Bible says, and the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. Now we're going to look at this verse, and this is a different message for Palm Sunday, but I tell you, my friends, as I was studying this passage, this verse right here, verse 26, just gripped me. Because when God speaks... There is something authoritative that we must grasp. When God speaks, there is something that ought to happen in our heart and in our life that means when I hear from the king, something powerful is about to happen. And let's read what happens here, verse 27. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, an eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure and had come to Jerusalem for to worship was returning and sitting in his chariot, reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself in this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was this, He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so he opened So opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation for his life is taken from earth? And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or some other man. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Who did Philip begin to talk about? Jesus, the king. Philip then communicated who the king was. All that he had done, Philip no doubt drew from Scripture and drew from personal life examples that he had seen. Let me tell you about Jesus. He opened the Scripture and said, listen, the Scripture of Jesus is prophesying of this king. And let me tell you what I experienced with King Jesus. Let me tell you what I saw him do. What I was called, uh, when I was called, and, and, wow, and how Jesus healed, and how he died on the cross, how he rose again. There in verse 36. And as they went there on their way, They came into a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. When they were come up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. This is the glorious passage. This eunuch, this Ethiopian who got saved, we'll look at him in just a minute. But it all began with a simple message from the king. When I hear from the king, the message is found in verse 26. The angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, Arise and go toward the south into the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. Everything else that happens in this account happens and begins with this message from the king. And everything that takes place following the years of fruitfulness in Ethiopia and in Africa happen and begin with a message from the king. You see, the message from the king cannot be discarded. The message from the king cannot be set aside. The message from the king is of the utmost importance. 
He is the King of Kings. And it begins with this message. I want to point out a couple truths about this, this process. Number one, notice that the message came with certainty. When God instructed him, he said this, Arise and go toward the south under the way that goes down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. God was intent for Philip to know what he wanted. There was a certainty about it. And my friends, God still speaks with certainty. Now we'll look at that. He doesn't always speak with all clarity, but he speaks with certainty. And he was very clear... He was very clear with Philip in this message, the messenger, the angel of the Lord. And it said, listen, arise, get up, and go down south. And go on the way from Jerusalem. God still speaks with certainty in our life. Every time we pick up the word of God, God will speak, and he will speak with certainty. God wants to communicate clearly with you and I in 2024. He's not trying to confuse you. He's not trying to trick you. All right, God wants to speak with certainty and clarity in your life. For some, it'll be the message of salvation. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. It cannot get any more certain than that. Only one way to heaven, and his name is Jesus Christ. He that hath the Son hath life. You believe in Jesus, you have the Son, and you have eternal life. And if you don't have the Son, you don't have life. It is not any more certain that you either have Jesus or you don't. The message is clear. In all thy ways acknowledge him. He shall direct thy paths. The message is clear. Don't trust yourself. The message is certain that you and I aren't smart enough to navigate life. The message is clear. Husbands, love your wives. He speaks with certainty. But Lord, you don't know how mean my wife is. Yes, he does. I may not know, but he does. And he still says, love your wives. Why does he say that? Because he's the king. He says, listen, to be kind and pray for those who criticize and ridicule and are mean to you and falsely accuse you. Lord, you don't know how bad they are. Yes, he does. And he speaks with certainty. He says, walk by faith, not by sight. But Lord, you don't know how much I don't know. You're right. But he does. And he still says with certainty, walk by faith. God spoke with certainty and the message come, comes with certainty. There's an old farmer. He's talking to his buddy. And he said, I have got the most docile donkey. He said, this donkey will do everything I ask it to do, and I just whisper in the ear. His friend who also had a few donkeys didn't believe his buddy, the fellow farmer. He said, I've got to see this. I've got to see this donkey. So he goes over to his buddy's house, the farmer who had made such an outrageous and bodacious claim. He said, all right, I want to see this donkey who you can just whisper and it'll do whatever you want it to do. So the farmer walks over to this donkey who's just sitting there munching its meal, minding its own business. And the farmer picks up a two-by-six and whacks the donkey in the head. And then, the, don- and then the, the farmer whispers to the donkey, sit down, and the donkey sits down. The farmer walks across uh, the, the barnyard and says, come, and the donkey very meekly walks over quickly comes. He says to the the donkey, roll over. And to the shock of his fellow buddy, the donkey tries to roll over. And his fellow fellow buddy, the one who who couldn't believe it, said, listen, I'm still amazed. He goes, but you said something a little bit wrong. He goes, you had to knock the donkey upside the head first. Why? He said, my, he said, it is true. He'll do everything I ask, but he has a hard time listening the first time. My friends, I wonder if sometimes as Christians we're that way. Or eventually we get ourselves in gear, but it's like God has to use a two by six at times to get our attention. Here the message came with certainty, but I want to notice something else in this passage. Look at the same verse. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip and said, Arise and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. Not only did the message come with certainty, the message caused an inconvenience. 
Philip, I want you to get up from where you're at. Whatever you're sitting down on, arise, laying down. A place where you're maybe gathering some rest. All right, where maybe you're taking a load off your feet. It could have been evening time, most likely was. And I want you to get up right now and go walking down the way toward the desert. This is an inconvenient message. Lord, can I wait a few moments? Can I put it off a few days? To the desert? The way toward the desert? Where it's hot? Where there's not a lot of water? Where there's not a local Walmart? All right, Lord, there's a better way to accomplish whatever you want to get done. And Lord, if you, if you let me help you, I'll make it better for both of us. Leave what you're doing. Stop what you're doing. And just follow a message. How many times when God speaks to us through his word or through another messenger, do we merely delay because of inconvenience. I was reading this morning in the book of Acts in my personal devotions where Paul is witnessing. And the man he's witnessing, witnessing says this, almost thou persuadest me to become a Christian. With that little phrase, he set aside the gospel because he said, I'm just not quite there. This message is a little bit too much for me to walk through. And I I'm smart enough to know this and been in my life long enough to know this, that as a Christian, sometimes we have the same answer to God when he asks of us things. I want you to go serve here, but Lord, it's just a little bit too inconvenient. And the message was not only came with certainty, but the message caused inconvenience. But notice this, please. Not only was it inconvenient, the message was incomplete. And this is what gripped my heart this past week. Sometimes... And can I say usually, God's message doesn't come completely to us. I got to be honest, as a pastor, as a Christian, I don't always like this part. Can you imagine being Philip that day, lying down or sitting down, most likely lying down, and God says, arise and go down the way on toward Gaza, which is the desert. Okay, Lord. And then what? What's the next step? Going to the desert. Now, if you were to follow this chapter back, you'd find that Philip is in the middle of a revival. He is in Samaria, and he's preaching the gospel, and people are getting saved left and right. He is seeing a harvest of souls. He is seeing fruit. He is seeing real transformation in men and in women and in boys and in girls. The church is growing, and God is using Philip in a way that's unbelievable. And then God says, I want you to go to the desert. You with me so far? What's in the desert, Lord? Because not everyone's saved here in Samaria. What's in the desert? Lord, is there some big gathering, some multitude I don't know about? What's in the desert, Lord? And see, God, often when he speaks to us, gives us just one slice. A little slice how many wish God would give you the whole piece? My hand is raised. I remember when I was heading off to college, I'm trying to decide that, and I was like, Lord, where am I going to college? What am I supposed to major in? Lord, I want all the answers. Lord, you tell me my whole life, and I'll fill in the details for you. And Lord, you and me will make a really good team together. I came here to First Baptist Church, and I was not married. Pastor Left, for whatever reason, had lost his mind for a few hours and hired a single youth pastor. I was like, Lord, you just tell me who I'm going to marry. I'll go find her. All right, I'll go find her. We often want to fill in the pieces, do we not? Or well, say, listen, God, tell me the whole thing. And once you, once you tell me the whole thing, Lord, then I'll be just fine. I'll, I'll figure out how to get there. I'll get a good path. And you and me, man, we will be a great team together, Lord. This is awesome. But yet God often speaks incomplete. And he just gives one little piece. Go to the desert. In fact, as you look at this account, you find out he gets down there and he sees a chariot. And then the spirit says to him again, go to the chariot. 
And this is what I, I know happened. I, the scripture tells us, it shows us this. Philip goes to the desert and he's like this. Waiting on you, Lord. He's not upset. He's not angry. He's just like, listen, I did my part. I'm right here. So you tell me next step. I want to hear from the king again. Whatever you got for me, I'm ready. Looking around. Maybe it's a holiday for me. Maybe it's a vacation. And then the spirit says, go to the chariot. And he runs to that chariot. And he jumps up on the chariot. This is it. You see, sometimes the message is incomplete. And sometimes in life, God's direction raises more questions than answers. What's, who's down there? What's down there? Why would I go now? Why tonight? Why not wait till tomorrow? What's happening? Well, here is good. There can't be as good. What can possibly happen down there? Talk to some scorpions? Collect some sand? It's in the desert. Yet, God's message is not like a bad set of Ikea directions. God's message is sometimes incomplete, and he gives us just one step. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy steps. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. God will be clear. God may be inconvenient in our mind, but God will give us just sometimes one step. I had a teacher one time say this. He said, it's a good thing God doesn't give you blueprints for your life. Because if he did, you would pick and choose. I know I would. Lord, that blessing you brought, I like that one. Let's, let, let's repeat that one a couple of times. And this struggle right here, this boss right here, this heartache right here, this, this problem in life, this sickness, this terrible person, this toxic situation, we remove all those. And we say, you know what? I won't take that one. No, thank you. No, thank you. No, thank you. And Lord, I like it. We'll get right here. And we want to see the man saved in the chariot. We want to see the victory right here. We just don't want to follow the process to get there. And our job is to listen to the king. So three commitments I want you to think about this morning when you hear from the king. Number one, when I hear from the king, I will trust that he knows what he's doing. You know why Philip got up and went? Because Philip trusted that he knew what he was doing, the king. Philip trusted that he had seen the king work before. He had seen King Jesus. He had missed the mark a few times. He'd forgotten about the resurrection, and the disciples all did. They'd all forgot about that. But he remembered this time when the king speaks. When I hear from the king, I will trust that he knows what he is doing. You know why Christians miss the mark on this? They don't trust the king. They think they got it figured out. They think they know better than the king. They think, you know what? That's a great idea, but I have my own way. When we hear from the king, we commit to trust that he knows what he is doing. A man was walking through a field one day, lost in his own thoughts. He came to an acorn tree. He saw at the bottom of this acorn tree all these small acorns next to this mighty tree. And he had this random thought, you know what, I think God made a mistake here. Because here you have the small pumpkin vine with large pumpkins, and these large pumpkins just end up with a small vine. And here you have a massive acorn tree, a beauty in nature in these little tiny acorns. I think God got it backwards. And about that moment, the wind blew in the tree and an acorn came and fell right on his head and bonked him on the head. And with clarity, he had this thought. You know what? God got it right. And sometimes we look at life and we don't trust he knows what he's doing. We look at the acorns and we say, I think God got it backwards, but I'm challenging you to commit today when the king speaks, trust that he knows what he's doing. The Lord, they look like acorns. But let's get a good plan. Number two, when I hear from the king, commit to eagerly looking to see his hand in my life. Philip, I believe, is standing there. He's waiting for the next spot. He is not complaining. He is not criticizing. He is not doubting. He is merely being still 
and resting in what he heard from the king. And my friends, that's a lesson for you now today. When the king speaks and we trust him, then we look to see what he's going to do. This is from you, king. And so you know what, Jesus? I'm eager. I am eager to know what will happen. Because I know that you would not send me here without some purpose, without some direction, without some fulfillment. And my friends, as a Christian, what, a better, what better place to be than to say, God, this is a great place you've got me. I can't wait to see what you're going to do. People think we're crazy to have a church in Saginaw, Michigan. But I can't wait to see what God keeps on doing here at First Baptist Church. Amen. You know what? God is at work eagerly to see the hand of God in our life. How many times have, has the situation, the storm, looked like the ship will sink? And then God steps in and calms the troubled waters as only he can. That is the attitude of someone who's listening for the king. And number three, when you hear from the king, find contentment in his purpose. Now we could look at this story and we could say, well, God took Philip from where thousands were being saved. Thousands. And he sent him all the way to see one guy. Lord, that does not seem like a good use of resources. God, that does not seem like it's a good thing. Revival's happening in Samaria, and you take Philip, the evangelist, the one who is really at, at, the, at the, uh, the crux of it, who God is using in Samaria, to go witness to one Ethiopian eunuch in the middle of the desert? Lord, that does not seem like a good decision. It doesn't make any sense. Philip's talents were better used over here. But yet Philip found the purpose and, and fulfillment in following God. And this is what happened. Church history tells us this, that from this man who traveled 1,600 miles to Jerusalem, 1,600 miles he traveled just to go worship. And he was not allowed to go in the temple. The Bible says, he says here he went to worship in Jerusalem. He was not allowed in the temple. Eunuchs were not allowed in the temple. So he went all that way, and he, couldn't, he could not go in the temple. He wasn't allowed. He went all that way to worship God. He worked for Candace. It was a Cush nation, an empire, a very, uh, very profitable and established empire. He took time off work. Who knew how long it, take, it took to go 1,600 miles in this chariot all this way? But from this man, church history tells us that the gospel touched not just Ethiopia, but in Africa. Amen. And it appears in our limited view that God sent Philip to go see a man in the middle of the desert so that all of Africa could hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the purpose of Jesus Christ. In fact, they say the gospel was so powerful that just a few centuries later, there was a king and he declared he declared that Africa, King Azana the Great, declared Christianity the state religion, making Ethiopia the, quote, first Christian nation. Amen. That's his purpose. That's his purpose. So when you hear from the king, trust that he knows what he's doing. When you hear from the king, Eagerly look for his hand. When you hear from the king, look to find his purpose and content in that spot. You see, sometimes we look around, we're like, but Lord, I wanted a bigger ministry. I wanted a, a better result. I thought I'd do more with my life. I thought that this message from you would be different. I didn't think I'd be stuck in the same place, the same spot. And yet God as the king, in his power, says, but I've got something bigger going on. So that we can truly say, all hail King Jesus. Amen. This morning, are you listening to the king? Are you trusting him that what he says is good? You know, for some, like I mentioned before, it's salvation. Where God has been knocking on the door of your heart. He wants you to Accept him as Savior. Listen to the King. For some who are Christians, today God has been clearly, with certainty, speaking to you. Perhaps in a relationship, perhaps with the gospel, 
perhaps an act of faith. And you almost make him use a two by six. So respond to the king today. Hear the message from the king. Because when you hear from the king, life will be completely different. Thank you.